Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to my talk, uh, What are Graph Databases and Why Do I Care? First, a little bit about me. Uh, so my name is Dave Beckberger. I am a senior architect at a consulting company called Xperio. Uh, Xperio is based out of Texas uh, in the United States. Uh, we have, and we specialize in uh, doing product discovery, UX design, and architecture and development for big data, IoT, and graph databases. Uh, myself, I've been developing software for about 18 years now. Uh, most of that time has been focused on developing heavily in the .NET stack, uh, but most recently I've moved over to doing complete, pretty much back-end development against graph databases. Been doing that for about two years now. Um, if you're interested in a little bit what we do, there's a couple of, uh, you know, you can go uh, to that page and take a look at uh, some of the things we do uh, building on top of graph databases specifically. Uh, in case anybody was wondering why I'm walking around in a sling, I was playing hockey on Sunday and decided to, you know, hit the wall instead of, uh, and I lost. So, <laughs> but what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're here to cover, uh, we're going to do a little bit of an introduction to what graphs are. Um, is anybody here actually using a graph database or has used a graph database in the past? Which one? Which one? Neo? 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 Okay. Um, so some of this will probably be familiar to you guys. Uh, then we're going to talk a bit about some of the use cases that graph databases are, are good at. Uh, and then we're going to talk a bit about the ecosystem. So the ecosystem for graph databases is changing literally every day. In fact, yes, I believe it was yesterday that Microsoft announced that they, they now have a new graph uh, processing layer on top of SQL Server. So it's a very fast growing uh, area. And then last, why you should care about it. You know, why not just use your relational database? I'll should walk through a couple of, of examples showing you just how graphs can help simplify uh, your life in some ways. So hopefully, as I said, this, hopefully you'll walk out of here with, you know, you'll know what a graph database do, is and isn't. Um, you know, you know what you can, you'll know what you can do with them. You'll have an understanding of what the ecosystem of graphs are, of graph databases are, and then what you can do to get started. So first off, we're going to walk through a little bit of what I like to call like graph 101. For, uh, um, yeah, first, you know, we're not talking about bar charts, line charts, spark lines. We're talking about interconnected webs of data. Um, so have any of you heard of the seven bridges of the Koenigsberg problem? I guess probably a lot of people did at some point. But So basically, the seven bridges of the Koenigsberg problem laid down, uh, was basically a famous problem uh, that was developed by uh, Leonard Euler in 1736. He was a Swiss mathematician. Um, and this be, it became what basically this problem laid down the foundations of what became graph theory uh, on which graph databases are built. Basically, there's, you know, there was two islands and, uh, in the middle of this river, so there's four pieces of land and seven bridges connecting them. And the problem was, is it possible to walk across every bridge once and only once? Um, and this became what known as an Eulerian walk, if you can actually do this successfully. Um, what Euler did was basically, he, would, he took this uh, real world problem, was, was able to abstract it out into what you see at the bottom here, which is uh, the abstract concept of nodes and edges. You know, uh, nodes and things are connecting them together. Just out of curiosity, does anybody know if you can actually solve this? No, yeah, you're right, you can't. Um, you can't, an Eulerian walk only works if you have uh, only, uh, if you have, it, oh, well, sorry. It doesn't work if you have greater than two, two nodes that have an odd number of edges, of incident edges going into or out. And incident edges are edges coming into or out of a node. So first off, what is a graph? Well, a graph is an ordered set of vertices and edges. And, and I promise it's the last time I'm going to talk about any more math theory for the rest of this talk. Um, uh, you know, vertices are basically a finite set of elements. And edges are a, basically a set of two subsets of vertices. So basically, you know, nodes or vertexes ha are connected by edges. It's pretty straightforward. The other way you can think about this is it's an entity and the relationship between them. Or uh, it's ver when, you're, when you're actually working with these, you, you tend to think of vertices are the nouns and edges are the verbs in your uh, domain model. So uh, both vertices and edges tend to have labels associated with them. You know, in this case, we have uh, two vertices which have the label of person, and the edge in between them is labeled as son of. They tend to, they can connect similar things. So in this case, 
We have Jason, who is the son of Alice, so both the vertices are people. They can also connect different things. Um, in this case, basically, we have, you know, a person lives in a city. So here, Jason lives in Boston. They can connect different types of things yet again. You know, here we have, uh, you know, a Spider-Man launch box, which is part of the Marvel Universe. Um, it can connect multiple different things at the same time. Basically, you, here we have, you know, a Spider-Man launch box, which is connected, to not, as, which is part of a franchise and is recommended for the age groups three to eight. Uh, edges also tend to have directions with them. Uh, specifically, when we're talking about edges with directions, we're talking about directed graphs, uh, which is a subset of graphs, but it's the type that most graph databases are built upon, so it's what we're going to talk about in this talk. Um, and as you can see here, you know, we have our previous graph, which had you know, Spider-Man launch box, which was part of the Marvel franchise and was recommended for ages three to eight. But now it also has an inward-facing edge from the back-to-school promotion for 2015. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today, both vertices and edges may have properties associated with them. Um, this is actually one of the biggest differences between a graph database and, some, say, something like a relational database. In a relational database, you know, the relations between your uh, different entities themselves can't really contain any metadata of their own. Um, you know, because in a relational database, the relations between your data is basically foreign keys. That's how you know, uh, you know one, one thing is related to another. You can't actually put metadata on those foreign keys. You end up having to build a table in between, like something I like to call, a, or I think of as a bridge table, um, that, to store any of that metadata. Well, in a graph database, relationships are first-class entities, and those entities are able to actually have that metadata on that relationship itself. And it's one of the more powerful things I, I find when actually working with graph databases. Uh, or migrating data from, graph, uh, from relational databases to graph databases. So what does a typical graph query look like? So find me all the, pro you know, in this case, we're going to look at what a, simple, a simple recommendation query sort of use case. In this case, we're going to want to find all the products that are for the same recommended age as a Spider-Man lunchbox. So what would you do? Uh, the way you would think about this is you'd start here at the Spider-Man lunchbox. And basically, you would walk out the recommended edge to the age range of 3 to 8. And then you would look for any other inward-facing edges that are also recommended for that uh, same age group. In this case, there's only one, which is the Iron Man toothbrush. Uh, when you're working in graph, what we just did is what's actually uh, you'll, will be referred to as the traversal of your graph. Uh, that was a very simple one, but they get much more complex than that. Um, you know. One of the thi you know, th things that uh, graph graphs do very well is they're able to go through an arbitrary number of hops in order to, uh, s in order to get to answers. Um, you know, so in this case, we're basically wanting to find all the products for that are for the same recommended age. It's part of a s the same or similar franchise as that Spider-Man lunchbox. Um, in this case, we basically added, somebody added to the graph that you know, the DC Comics universe is a similar franchise to the Marvel Universe. So what would, ha what would we do here? Uh, basically, the way you would traverse this graph, or think about how you would traverse this graph, is first off, you would traverse the, same, the graph the same way of going out the recommended age you know, to, to the age range, and then over to the Iron Man toothbrush to get that as one of the responses back. Um, but you would also basically, at the same, oh, in parallel, you would actually traverse out the part of edge to the Marvel franchise. You would then traverse out the similar edge to the DC Comics franchise, and then you would traverse back the part of edge to get the Superman pillowcase. So you would be, in this case, you would turn the Superman pillowcase and the Iron Man toothbrush. But as you can kind of see as we're walking through this, it, you know, each one took a different arbitrary path to get through there. You know, and now someone has gone and added sales data to the graph. So basically, we want to build a more powerful recommendation engine based on items that people bought. Well, as you can see, if you wanted to solve, you know, I'm not going to walk through this one because this gets far more complex, but you are able to basically walk through a very large arbitrary number of hops to get to that same sort of information here. Uh, if you want to do something like this in a relational database, it basically would re probably require a lot of recursive common table expressions, unions, joins, and it would be a query I would not want to run or I would not want to write, maintain, or probably try to like, write any performance increases on because it would be uh, quite a headache to actually get it to work 
within a reasonable period of time. So I guess before we go on, are there any questions about what we've talked about so far? This one? Yeah, so the question here was, in this, uh, in this query, would you get the Iron Man toothbrush twice? Depends on how you actually put the query. That you, a lot of these, uh, when you're querying these, you could actually, uh, you, by default, you would probably get it twice, but a lot of the query languages allow you to remove duplicates. Okay, so next we're going to talk a bit about uh, some of the use cases for graph databases. So what are common graph type problems? So common graph type problems are things like dependencies, uh, you know, failure chains, uh, order of operations. Um, something like this is a lot of time used for things like root cause analysis. Um, you know, order of operations, I don't know if any of you were in the talk uh, with the, uh, about uh, Terraform and console yesterday, but that was actually a great example of uh, basically finding dependency graphs. Um, you know, in order to build my infrastructure, I have to build the, you know, the VPC before I can build a subnet that's part of that VPC. Well, that's a graph type problem to do that. You know, clustering, finding things that are closely related to each other. Um, friends of friends, you know, who, who hears on LinkedIn and gets the like, these, these are people you might know or, you know, Facebook, same sort of idea. That's, uh, you know, would be a clustering sort of problem. Or fraud, uh, fraud is actually another very common use case for graphs. Uh, um, it, you know, uh, they use a variety of different algorithms, but clustering is one of them to basically say, is this group of transactions similar to another, or you know, clustered together with another group of fraudulent, or known fraudulent tra transactions. Um, similarity, you know, similar, you know, you wanna find things that have similar paths or patterns associated with them. Um, you know, let's say you use something like a recruiter, you know, you work on recruiting software and you wanna say, I, you know, from the position I'm at, I want to get to a CEO. What other, what is the most common path or what is a very similar path of, of people that started like I have to get to become CEO of a company? You know, matching or categorization, um, you know, flow, flow cost type, uh, type problems, things like, you know, Google Maps are a flow, toss, flow cost type problem. I want to find the shortest path from A to B. Centrality and search problems, you know, uh, you want to find the most influential person in a social network. You know, uh, another example of dependency type problem is a pipeline. You know, what is the root cause of a failure? Um, you know, how do I route flow from X to Y when I take Y offline? You know, example of vertices in like a pipeline uh, would be something like a storage tank, a refinery, or wells. Um, edges would be pipelines, control lines, things of that nature. Industrial assets, uh, you know, would be a clustering sort of problem. You know, if part A fails, what other parts tend to fail with it? You know, I have a large group of industrial, uh, maybe I, I run a trucking fleet, and if, you know, truck A fails, what other, what other trucks tend to fail with it? Where they, you know, and then you can do, as I you can go back and actually do re root cause analysis, find out why they may have failed together. They, maybe they were all in the same place that had a sandstorm at the same time or something like that. You know, um, Examples of, uh, you know, vertices in here are things like parts or assemblies or pieces of equipment and edges are things like consists of, connected to, is compatible with. Similarity, uh, you know, an example of similarity as uh, social networks and fraud. This is, social networks are probably one of the, the most common uh, use cases that people think of with graphs, you know, LinkedIn and uh, Facebook made using graphs for a social network a very common thing uh, out there anymore. You know, which of my friends is the most influential? You know, which of my users' activity, or, or is my users' activity similar to a known fraudulent pattern? You know, here you would have vertices that are things like people or business or transactions. Um, you know, edges are things like phone calls, emails, memberships, purchases. Categorization. Um, Recommendation engine is a very uh, good example of a categorization. You maybe you want to, you have a ca different categories of people that you want to do recommendations against. Um, you know, based on my history of buying, of purchasing products, what am I likely to purchase? Um, you know, what type of customer I want to 
am I when I use a system? You know, here you'd have things like, you know, vertices would be things like users or orders or web pages if you're doing something like click stream tracking. Um, you know, edges would be things like purchased or clicked. Um, worked with customers in this space where they basically have click streams coming in of applications and they want to be able to basically uh, categorize you into different uh, use cases or different groups of users to basically show you something like targeted advertising, things of that nature. Uh, you know, flow cost problems. Uh, you know, transportation is the first one I tend to think of here. You know, what is the shortest path between X and Y? I don't know about you guys, but I've used Google Maps since I've been here in London. <laughs> And that's an example of how you actually get from, you know, X to Y. It's really, it has to do an unknown number of hops to get from, a, you know, from one place to another. You know they'll connect somehow, but you don't know how many, uh, you know, connections it'll take to get there. While it's something you can do in a relational database, it's actually very difficult to do uh, unknown numbers of joins. You end up with recursive functions, and they tend to be very not, are very unperformant. You know, uh, also, things like, you know, I'm going to take Station X offline for maintenance. What's the effect going to be on my, you know, transportation network? How's that, how am I going to route traffic around it? What are the different options? You know, here you would have vertices that are things like stations or cities and edges of things like railways, roadways, intersections. Actually, intersections, I'm sorry, would be a, a vertice in this case. Centrality and search. Uh, the Internet. And the Internet is nothing but a giant graph of data. Um, this is actually where uh, Google really, for, for those of you that are uh, old enough to remember AltaVista, you know, AltaVista was based on basically just searching the text inside your web documents. And this is where Google actually made, was differentiated from AltaVista when they first came out, as they actually not only searched the text inside the document, but they, they searched uh, and indexed how those documents were linked to other documents. They basically built a graph of the web, you know. But, you know, centrality and search also is useful for things like what are the critical parts of my network? You know, uh, you know I'm storing network management data, or uh, I'm storing data about how my network is configured. I want to find the most critical piece of my infrastructure. You know, if this router goes down, half of my network is going to go down because it's the one single point of failure inside my network. Uh, that's a sort of graph problem to solve. You know, here you would have things like, you know, your vertices would be like routers or computers. Your edges would be like, you know, fibers or Ethernet connections, microwave connections. In the case, if you're thinking about the uh, Google use case, it would be things like links of web pages. Uh, really, when it comes down to it, basically any, any interaction you, out there you have as a graph, you know, here's other sorts of problems that you can solve with graphs. You know, which professor publishes the most influential paper? Maybe you have a link of all you know, pa papers published in the last five years as well as all their uh, citations. And you want to go out and find which of those papers has been cited the most, either by that paper or by another paper that cited papers that have cited it. Uh, one we actually kind of run across quite, uh, quite often is something like, I have a user named B. Smith, I have a user named Brian Smith, uh, maybe I'm a large, uh, maybe I work for a large company and we have multiple different uh, ways in which a, cu a customer can interact with him. Well, I want to figure out if those two people are the same person in order to basically provide them a better experience, a more unified experience across uh, multiple, plat maybe a web and a mobile platform. Healthcare and life sciences, you know, basically how does this drug interact with other drugs? Um, and then the one I mentioned earlier, you know, which is the most common case, uh, common career path to get from myself to being CEO of a company. So, what sort of industries use graph? Um, this is by no means a definitive list of either industries or um, how the graphs are used inside those industries. Uh, but you know, somewhere like, uh, but this is, uh, is, is an example of some of the ways in which uh, people use it, and some of the ways we've worked with our customers in these areas. You know, software companies, they deal with Knox and data management, and that's really nothing but a giant graph of how you, you know, everything, how all your networks are connected together. Social networks are an obvious one, uh, you know, Facebook, your LinkedIn's, things like that. One that actually kind of surprised me when we first came across this uh, as, a, as a use case is like identity and access management. Um, you know, something like what Active Directory does uh, in a Windows world is a real, is really comes down to being a graph problem because you are in groups A, B, and C, and in group A, you are admin, and group B, you only have read-only access, 
group C, you only have, you know, maybe you have read write access, and group C has access to a folder that group A has access to, and group B has access to, and there's subfiles inside those. What actual access do you have to a file is really basically a, a, a gigantic graph to find out what, you know, all the different permutations you have to get to your, you know, to actually have access to that end piece of data. Um, financial services. You know, fraud prevention is probably the most common one you hear in this, you know, uh, in, the, in, in the financial services. But, you know, there's also, they do social marketing, they do impact analysis, and they actually do sentiment analysis. They're, they're, you know, there are financial services companies out there that are reading your Twitter feeds and your Facebook posts and finding out what you think about different companies because what you think about different companies affects how much, or affects whether their stock goes up or down that day sometimes. Um, so there's companies out there doing stuff like that. Um, you know, telecommunications, network management, much similar to software companies, master data management, um, geospatial search. Um, there's telecommunications companies out there that basically are tracking, you know, basically, obviously they're tracking where you're using your cell phone, and they're trying to basically uh, group together, you know, cluster together groups of people into to see maybe that you're, you went, maybe you and all your friends went to dinner at the same time, at the same place for roughly the same amount of time. They're trying to find this information out about you, uh, so they can better uh, market to you. Uh, you know, uh, web, social, and recruiting. You know, social graphs, knowledge graphs, sentiment analysis. Yet again, um, probably one of the more up and coming places is, uh, that are using graphs are things like healthcare and life sciences. You know, they're looking for drug interactions. You know, looking for different things about gene sequencing. Uh, you know, they're looking for impact analysis on treatment and care. Are there any questions on some of the use cases before we move on? Okay, uh, the next thing we're going to talk a bit about is the graph ecosystem that's out there. So first off, what, what is a graph database? And I know there's a couple of you that have used graph databases. Have anyone else used any other NoSQL sort of databases, or is most people coming from the relational world? Okay. Well, uh, the graph, graph databases are a type of NoSQL data store. Um, they store data based on graph concepts, so, you know, vertexes, edges, and properties. Uh, there's several different types out there that we'll talk a bit about here in a moment. Um, specifically, the ones that are out there are RDF triple stores, property graph models, uh, and what I tend to call processing frameworks. And what graph databases do um, is they really help you effect, if efficiently and effectively navigate connected data, um, you know, data that's highly connected with one another. Um, so a little, you know, base of database types. So what you'll see on the screen here is basically the different types of, the five basic types of data stores that are out there uh, and how they each handle uh, increasing data complexity. I mean, the simplest ones out there are things like key value stores. Um, you know, key value stores are something like a DynamoDB uh, from AWS or Redis. And they store very simple data. They store a key value pair of data. Um, you want to get a little more, have, your data has a little bit more complexity to it and stores more than just one value to uh, a key, you get something like a column family store. Um, you know, it allows you to store basically single rows of data, but those rows are not, uh, don't have relationships to other rows. Uh, don't have explicit relationships to other rows, I should say. This is something like uh, Apache Cassandra, Apache HBase. Um, you get a little more, uh, you know, you get data that has a little more, uh, has a little more relation, a little more complexity to it. And when I'm talking about complexity here, what I'm really referring to is basically the, how the data is related to one another and how those relationships are uh, manifested themselves in the data store. Um, so you get something like a document data store. Well, you know, a document data store, the, the documents themselves are pretty atomic units of information, but inside them they can have uh, highly nested relations of data. Um, you know, something like MongoDB or CouchDB are pretty good uh, examples of doc are pretty common examples of document data stores. I'm guessing most a lot of people here have probably used one or the other of those. And then there's the one that we're all familiar, familiar with: relational databases. You know, relational databases are good at are good at storing relational data. It's what they're built on. You know, they have you know tables that have you know f uh, 
foreign keys to other tables. They have foreign keys to other tables, and you can build out a hierarchy of data there. You know, these are your Oracles, your SQL servers, your Postgres, your MySQLs, things of that nature. And then for even more complex data that uh, doesn't fit in your relational database, you have graph databases. Uh, two of the most common ones out there are, are Neo4j <laughs> and uh, Datastax Enterprise Graph. Those are the two that uh, we work with the most. Uh, there's many more out there, as you'll see here in a moment. Uh, but as mentioned earlier, the real big difference between a relational database and a graph database is that in a graph database, the relationships are also first-class entities in your system, and those relationships can, can store properties against them. One other thing to note is that, data, that graph databases are the fastest growing type of data store out there at the moment. Um, since this has started in January 2013 until this January, they've got, had almost a 600% growth. In, uh, so this comes from a, uh, I don't know if any of you know dbengines.com, uh, but if you don't, it's actually a very good site to, uh, that will kind of give a base comparison of different types of data stores out there. So just, uh, you know, this is part of the reason why I wanted to come and do this talk was the fact that this is a very fast growing uh, area. And it's something that you guys will probably run into as, uh, or at least might want to think about using in some of the projects as you're coming up, or that are coming up for you. So the first differentiation I'm going to make in the types of graph databases is the difference between a database and a framework. Um, a graph database is basically built, you know, a, one of the differences between a database and a framework is that databases will run real-time queries. Um, they hand, some of them can handle both transactional and analytical type workloads, you know, and they persist the data themselves. Um, they, they tend to have no, they'll have no scaling feature, or uh, no SQL features like scaling and high availability, whereas frameworks really are, are built to work on humongous data loads. And by humongous data loads, I'm talking about data loads that tend to not fit, uh, don't even necessarily fit in the memory of the servers that they're running on. Uh, they're, they're built for OLAP workloads, and they, they use another method underneath uh, them to actually persist the data. It's often something like a Hadoop cluster. Um, the way I think of this is basically a framework essentially is a library that sits on top of something else to run your graph data on. So you have to sit there, you'll have to load your data into that graph framework, you have to run your graph queries, and you'll have to persist your data out to something else. A database itself is just like a SQL database. It, it handles both not only the, the, the querying of the data, but also the persisting of the data back. So some of the common graph processing frameworks out there, if you get into this space, are something like uh, Apache Giraffe. I'm not quite sure how that's supposed to be a draft, but that's what it is. <laughs> um, that is that, you know, so you have something like Apache Giraffe, which is built on top of Hadoop. That's where it runs uh, for its persistence layer. You have something like uh, GraphX, which is actually part of the Apache Spark project. Um, then you have things like Oracle, Things, you know, which is obviously built on top of Oracle. Uh, you'll have things like ThingSpan, GraphBase, InfoGrid, and this, this little guy here is actually Apache Hama. Um, one interesting one to note here is the Apache Tinkerpop project. Uh, so the Apache Tinkerpop project is made up of a couple of different parts. Um, it, in and of itself, it's a graph processing framework, um, but that graph processing framework actually specifies a, a query language associated with it called Gremlin, uh, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. But that, uh, as well as the, the, the uh, query language, it basically also specifies an interface and a graph engine that are used by some of the databases we'll talk in a, about here in a moment. So it's kind of a very, uh, it's a complete, uh, you know, it's kind of ha has a lots of, it's hands in a lots of different pieces of the graph database world. Uh, probably more than anything else, but in and of itself, you can actually just use it as a graph processing framework. So the next kind of differentiation I made, and, and just to be honest, th these differentiations are semi-arbitrary on my part. They're not really arbitrary as they are sort of... Uh, there's some logic behind it, but other people might group these slightly differently. Um, but the next one I'm going to talk about is 
basically the two types of graph databases that are out there. One's called RDF, or all, you'll hear them called RDF triple stores. Um, they work with a, a subject, predicate, object, triple. Um, the, the entities that you store are these triples. Um, this comes from a background of the semantic web. Uh, it has well-defined standards associated with this. And RDF databases are very efficient at finding relationships inside your data. Um, the other type is a property model graph database. Um, this works with the nodes, edges, and properties, very similar to what the, the first section where I was showing, uh, talking about. It has separate entities for nodes and edges, and both the nodes, nodes and edges can have properties on them. And what property model graph databases are, very, are, are good at is they're good at efficiently traversing relationships in your data. And, and I'll show you an example of the difference between these two here in a moment. Uh, but the biggest thing to probably take away from this slide is RDF databases are very good at finding relationships in your data, and property model graph databases are very good at uh, traversing relationships in your data. So an example of an RDF uh, sort of an RDF database, what, what sort of data you would store in that is, you know, People, are a people with a common parent are siblings. And a father is a parent. So you would put these rules in. Uh, the way RDF databases work is basically through an inference engine. So you basically put these rules in as you've seen here. The next thing you'd put in is you'd put in a couple of facts. You'd put in the fact that Mike is the father of John and that Mike is the father of Steve. Uh, what would happen then is that, that that inference engine in the RDF database would basically infer new facts about your data based on the rules that you've already entered. So in this case, it would be able to infer that John and Steve are siblings because, you know, each, you know they, they both have a father, their father is Mike, and people with a common parent are siblings. Property model graph databases, on the other hand, would look more what you have on the which is at the left, right up here? Whatever, this one over here. <laughs> Don't know my left from my right, sorry. <laughs> um, thing, uh, what you would have to put in here is you would have to you know, put in the same information. You'd put in a node that is, you know, that there's a person named Mike a person, and a person named John and that there, there's a relationship between them of father of. Uh, you would then put in that there's a person named Steve and the relationship would be father of. And here's where property model graphs get a bit, or definitely differ a little bit than RDF sort of databases. So now, now you have an option. You can either, if, when you go to actually run your traversal on this, you can either basically run a traversal that would say, okay, you know, give me, you know, for, I want to find, you know, for, for John, I want to find all the, you know, I want to find his father, and then I would find, you know, who else he's the father of, and be able to, in my application logic, know that those two peoples are siblings, or you could, at the time you put the data in, put that relationship in. Um, relationships in a property model graph are basically pre-computed joins of your data. Um, so you can either basically, it works either way, you could either basically navigate this relationship um, inside your application, inside your traversal, or you'd have to pre-compute that join ahead of time. Are there any questions on this? I, I know this is a very kind of confusing sort of concept. Yes. So the, so the question was, uh, in the RDF database, you basically define the, uh, you know, the, you define the rules once, and you put the data, and when the data comes in, you, you do it on the, in the property model graph, do you only define sibling of once? Well, you would need to define sibling of for each, peop, each place you want to have that relationship. So this is where, uh, it's kind of an example of how RDF databases are great at finding information that you don't have, uh, because it's able to basically infer that this is a new relationship type, whereas property model graphs are really better at traversing the, how those relationships already exist. So that, you know, if you want to be efficient and you want to find everyone that's a sibling of somebody, you need to put this sibling of edge in for every person that's a sibling of. You know, maybe there's John, Steve, Mike, Tom, Bill, G Jane, Sue. Mike had a lot of kids, what, what can I say? Um, 
you would want to put the sibling of edge in for each of this. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. So what are some common property model graph databases? Um, you know, the, probably the most common one out there right now is Neo4j. Um, it's, definitely the, probably the, it's definitely the industry leader in this space. It's what the, the two people in this room have used. It's, it's probably the easiest to get started with. Um, then you move on some, to something like Datastax Enterprise Graph. Um, this is a, a very, built to basically scale to larger data sizes. Um, it's built on top of basically Datastax Enterprise, if any of you are familiar with that. Um, well, then you have one called OrientDB. Uh, OrientDB is actually, you'll see it again later because it's not only a property model graph database, but a multi-model graph database, which I'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, but these three that you see across the top here are commercial, uh, commercial uh, licensed products. Um, they each have like a community version essentially that you could you can try out for free. Um, the bottom two here are first one you'll see is called Janusgraph, which is actually a, a new one on the market. It's actually a fork of an old uh, one of an old of a database that's been around for a while called Titan. Uh, this is actually very new and as of I think it was last Thursday. This was announced as part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, so it's an open source uh, project uh, run by the Linux Foundation. Actually, the company I work for, Xpiro, is one of the, uh, the, the key members in there, along with people like Google, Hortonworks, and IBM. Uh, so I have to throw a little shout out to that one while I was here. Uh, and then there's another uh, very interesting one that's, I believe, only it's either an alpha or beta called dgraph uh, that's built to do a highly distributed model uh, of graph databases, of property model graph databases. The next, uh, 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 this slide, it basically shows you some of the common uh, RDF data stores that are out there. Um, in this slide, uh, you know, you have ones like Stardog, Allegro Graph, Blaze Graph, and OntoText. Uh, of these, the only one that has an, any sort of open source option with it is Blaze Graph. All of the rest of them are um, commercial licensed. Then you kind of get into the middle ground of these ones we call, uh, I, I called multi-model data stores. Um, you have ones, so basically what these are, are these are essentially, uh, I think of them as basically a framework, you know, graph processing framework on top of a, another NoSQL data store, no, another type of data store, but they both come together in one package. Um, so for example, something like an OrientDB, you can store not only uh, unstructured data in the form of documents in it, but you can store graph data. Um, under the covers, it's a document data store with a graph layer on top of it, but they expose both of them to you, uh, which can be very useful depending on what you're trying to actually accomplish. If you want to accomplish, uh, if you have a, a use case where you, have, where you want to use a multi-model sort of approach, maybe you have a bunch of unstructured data you want to store, but you want to store the relationships between those data inside a graph, Something like an Orient DB would be uh, great for that. You know, uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Elasticsearch, but it's the same sort of thing. They recently released a graph model on top of a graph framework on top that on top of their product, but be, comes as part of their product. So, like I said, it's kind of a it's it's a middle ground between the two. And then you know you have SAP HANA, Arango DB, and Virtuoso. This. Everything I'm showing up here in all these slides, there's, there's more of these types out there than I have on these slides. I just try to show a representative sample of some of the more common ones. So before we go on, are there any ecosystem, or ecosystem questions out there? Okay, so your data isn't in a graph. What do you do with it now? Well, the first thing you're going to probably want to do is query your data out. Um, what I'm showing here are really, each of the data stores we showed tend to have their own proprietary query language. A lot of times there's some SQL-like uh, query language. Sometimes it's, it's almost exactly the same as SQL. Uh, what I'm showing here is basically the, uh, the only the standard or open source languages that are here that are implemented by multiple different products. Um, so the easiest one here is down here with RDF databases. There's a W3C standard called Sparkle. Pretty much any of the RDF databases out there will implement at least some version of Sparkle. Uh, some are more compatible than others, just like you know every other standard out there in the world. <laughs> um, 
Up here at the top is where it definitely gets a little bit more uh, complex. So the first one you see here is what's called the OpenCypher project. Uh, Cypher is the native graph language that uh, was developed by Neo4j. Um, I think it was a little over a year ago. They, uh, imp they basically opened the specifications for Cypher in a project called OpenCypher for other uh, database vendors to implement them s a version of Cypher for, them, for their own language. Uh, Cypher is a very declarative language that's reminiscent of SQL. Uh, I'll show you some actual examples here in a second. Um, and it, this currently, I believe, has somewhere around 10 implementations of which I think I believe four go against databases. Don't, don't quote me on those numbers because those, yet again, those numbers are changing all the time, but it gives you a rough idea of how, uh, adopted it, how well adopted it is. Uh, the next one you'll see here with the cute little green guy is Gremlin. Uh, this is the query language that's specified as part of the Apache Tinkerpop project I talked about before. And it takes a more traversal-based approach to the, uh, basically to your syntax. And it currently has uh, basically 17 plus implementations, somewhere along that. The last one you'll see here is actually GraphQL. Uh, GraphQL was uh, basically developed by Facebook. And it's different from these other two in as much as it's really a JSON-based query language that's uh, for your API. Uh, you'll understand a little more what I mean here in a second when I show you an example, um, but it's it's a bit of a different uh, beast than these other two, which are kind of more like comparable what SQL would be for the relational databases. So for these property model queries, this is the basic property model we're going to work against. Um, it's pretty basic. We're only going to do a small part of it, but basically, you know, we're, what we're worried about here is we're going to have, a, we want to find all the people who acted in a film that was directed by J.J. Abrams. So basically, we're going to basically come from this person, uh, you know, we're going to find the person whose name is J.J. Abrams. Then we're going to follow this directed in edge to the movie. And then we're going to follow this acted in edge back to all the people that acted in movies that he directed. So the first query we're going to look at is the open cipher query. Um, as you can see, basically, it's pretty easy to read these sort of queries. You know, um, things to note about cipher is basically what you'll end up with is basically the, bright, the uh, round brackets are the different types of nodes you're looking for, and the square brackets are the edges. And what you'll see is actually uh, the square brackets will have dashes and greater than or less than signs uh, in front of them to basically indicate the edge that, that, direction is, that you're traversing out that direction. So the next one is Gremlin. Um, Gremlin is, as you can see, is a bit different than the op than Open Cipher in as much as what you're doing here is you're is your, uh, basically the way I think about it is I'm actually this is I'm telling it exactly how I want it to walk through my graph in order to get the information I'm looking for. Uh, so basically the way this works. So G dot V uh, for those of you not familiar is basically the way you say give me all of all the vertices in my graph. I want to, you know, I want to find a person edge, or person node that has a name of J.J. Abrams. I then want to follow the, an outwards directed edge called directed in. Then I want to, so that would take us to the movie vertice. And then I want to go back an inward directed edge called actinid, acted in, to get back to the people. This, this dot next is actually a, a very specific thing to Gremlin that's a, um, basically it's lazily evaluated. And until you put something on there to force it to be evaluated, it won't actually print anything out. Uh, that, that dot next will actually force it to print out all your results. So as you can see, these are very similar, yet different to one another. But when you look at uh, GraphQL, ye, as you can see, it's very uh, familiar if you're used to doing something like REST calls but it doesn't really look or map directly or as easily to uh, Gremlin or OpenCypher. What it's doing here is basically saying for, I, have a, I want to find a person who has a name of J.J. Abrams. Then I want to go out the directed. That actually should say directed in. That was my bad. <laughs> um, you know, I, I want to find all the things he directed in and then all the people that acted in those and return the name. Um, as I said, uh, you know, this is a very 
you know, it, it was a standard produced by Facebook. I always think of these as very useful if you're looking at building out REST endpoints because who wants to send this sort of query across uh, a REST endpoint? Are there any questions on this before I go on? So the next thing is how do you visualize your data? You know, um, you know, for visualizing your data, there's, there's a lot of uh, off-the-shelf products. Uh, something here like Lincurious Enterprise is actually a very powerful tool uh, for doing some visualization of your data. Um, something like Keylines is probably one of the leaders in actually uh, basically like web, web toolkits to uh, work against your data. If you want to do a lot of different customizations, something like a D3 is very useful. Uh, where this starts to get very interesting is if you have a geospatial type of problem. Um, a lot of times what we find is that the problems we're working with end up having a geospatial aspect with, to them as well. Not only do I want to know how things were connected, I want to know where they were at at the times that, that certain events happened, especially if you're thinking like in the IoT space. Um, so these are just some of the tools out there. Um, but what can you kind of do with it? So these are some uh, basically some screens of things that we have worked on. One, uh, and and the, the, my UX colleagues would, 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 would harass me if I didn't basically uh, say that just because it's a graph piece of data, uh, you know, just because the underlying data is a graph doesn't mean you need to show it just as no charts. You know, in the case of here, you know, this was an IoT sort of demo, uh, you know, where you were following trucks and following sensors. That makes sense to basically kind of almost show that as a no chart of the, the flow of where it's going. But over here, this is a healthcare app. The graph data underneath the data underneath it may be stored in a graph, but that's not how the end user is thinking about it, and the end user shouldn't know or necessarily care that the data is being stored as a graph. Um, so, you know, applying good UX principles to these sorts of things are uh, are really important in order to uh, basically get the best information out of it. You know, good examples of this are something like a LinkedIn or Facebook, or you know. They don't show you that the graph of how your friends, how they got fr to the friends you may know. They just show you a list of people that you may know. But it's being powered under the covers by a graph. You know, Amazon recommendations are the same sort of way. You know, people who bought this also bought that. Well, that's being powered by a graph at some level. But they're not telling you that it's powered by a graph. They're just showing you the, the output in a way that's easily consumed by the user. So the last sort of section here is, is why should you care about it? Well. We're going to look at a basic product recommendation uh, engine here. You know, I want to find all the products that I have purchased. Uh, I, I find me all the products I haven't purchased, but were purchased by customers who purchased other things I bought. Pretty simple, or pretty common. Uh, I want our need for a uh, you know any sort of e-commerce site is is kind of to power out your uh, product recommendation. Well, he, here's roughly the sequel it takes to do that. Um, you know. Uh, you, the actual specifics don't matter. Uh, I'll share the slides with you later if anybody wants. But here's the uh, corresponding cipher in Gremlin to answer that same query. Um, you know, for you know, if you look at the Gremlin or the cipher, it's about it takes these three lines to answer what takes pretty much all the way down to this group by to get to the same sort of answer. Uh, you know, and the Gremlin takes a little bit more than that, but you know, in, in general. You're talking, you know, four, you know, three or four lines versus probably 15 uh, to get your answer. Performance. performance? Uh, the, I mean, obviously, performance is going to be very different depending on what you're doing. But I would not, rec I would not guess that the performance of your SQL is going to be super. Uh, is not going to be super performant, uh, whereas the cipher and the Gremlin will be because that's what they're optimized for. Um, so the next use case is basically to find an org chart. You know, I want to find the employee, all the employees, who their supervisor is, and where they live inside the organization. And, you know, basically build out a simple org chart. Well, to do that in the SQL, you essentially have to end, you end up having to build this recursive, uh, recursive function to basically pull the information out. You know, it takes all the way till down here these, you know, probably 12 lines uh, of code to get to basically the, just the rough data before you actually can even pull it out. Well, here is the, uh, the cipher to do it. Basically, a, 
These, the cipher to do all of these 12 lines is pretty much this first line will return you all the data. After that, it's actually just formatting the data the way you want to actually pull it back out. In Gremlin, it basically takes about the line and a half to do the same sort of thing. Um, you know, here's, you know, kind of shows you how, you know, something like this is, pro is more performant, or can be more performant and is certainly easier to maintain for these sorts of uh, queries. So how do you know if you need a graph? This is, you know, the question we get all the time. Well, if you can answer yes to any of these sorts of questions, then you might have a problem that is worthy of, uh, th th that would be worthwhile to take a look at using a graph database for. You know, do you have queries with multiple joins and unions of data? Do you have recursive uh, common table expressions? Is the performance of your joins or common table expressions poor and can't be increased by uh, other means, or you know, by standard traditional relational database techniques? Uh, is the structure of your data continuously evolving? Um, one of the things I haven't touched on much here is the fact that uh, graph databases tend to be very good at, at allowing for evolving and flexible schemas. You know, you, if you want to add a new relationship type to your graph, you just add a new relationship type to your graph. You don't need to go in, m change tables, add default values, things like all those things you end up having to do in a relational database to make that, uh, to basically make it, uh, you know, uh, work. Is your domain that you're working in a natural fit for them? You know, are you storing IT dependencies? Are you doing network management? Are you doing relationships between people? Or any of those sort of things we talked about in the use cases? And the one that probably uh, sticks with me more than anything else is, are you dealing with the connections between things more often than you're dealing with the things themselves? Do you really, is what you're really trying to care about how, thing, is how the things are connected together more than what is connected together? Um, that's a really strong indicator to myself that, uh, you know, you might want to look at using a graph database. So if you're actually interested in getting started, uh, if you go to this website, we actually have uh, this Getting Started with Graph link, and it basically provides a long list of just different resources that you can uh, go out to get started with graph, including links to pretty much all of the data stores we talked about up here, uh, at least the versions that you can download for free, their tutorials, uh, their Getting Started pages, things like that. Um, and if anyone's interested and wants this slide deck, just come see me after this, and uh, I can send it to you so you can get some of these addresses or whatever. So I guess, uh, are there any questions? So the question was, uh, do these graph databases allow you to partition data to sort across multiple nodes in sort of a cluster? And also allow you to do queries on the, the partition data. Yeah, and allow you to do queries on the partition data. The answer to that question is, it depends on which graph data store you're looking at. Um, I, I am not as familiar with a lot of the RDF ones, so I can't answer to those specifically as much, but uh, on the property gra model graph database side, Yes, they can. If you look at something like, uh, like Datastax Enterprise is basically, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Apache Cassandra at all, it's built on a clustering technology uh, by default, and Datastax Enterprise Graph is built on top of that. So it's absolutely, by default, those are partitioned. Uh, if you're looking at something like Neo4j, if you go to their Enterprise Edition in their most recent release, they actually added causal clustering to their, uh, to their graph databases. Um, if you look at something like an oriented DB, they have the ability to partition that data out as well uh, using their own internal mechanisms. So yes, each of them have it, and each of them do it in a different way. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Any other questions? So the question was, are people using these as systems of record or as the primary data store, or are they using them as secondary data stores? The answer to that is both. Uh, it depends on what the specific use case is. Uh, I've worked with customers where they have basically migrated, either have or are in the process of migrating all their data to be stored inside a graph as the system of record. I've also worked with customers where this is used as a a secondary system, um, a lot of times, especially if they want to, if they have a small part of their application or their, it's a small part of the system where they have a very graph-based problem that they want to solve in a small area, 
you know, they may keep their large Oracle installation or SQL Server installation to be the system of record and then transfer the data into this uh, either in batches or continuously to handle those sorts of dependency queries or whatever it is they're trying to actually pull out that, that is better solved in a graph. Any that, pro that, that combine an RDF with a property database? Uh, actually, uh, there's several of them that uh, will allow you to traverse them as both. I believe actually Oracle does this. A Stardog, I believe, does that as well. And I Blaze Graph, I believe, also will allow you to basically do either RDF or uh, property graph traversals of them. I can't say I've done anything with those uh, in that specific use case, so I don't have any personal uh, experience with it, unfortunately. But I believe they both allow, uh, but those ones I believe allow you to do it in both ways. Okay, that's it. Thank you guys very much.